For Ben, thank you for uh, you know, everybody gathered here today as we continue to, to learn and, and know more about you, become a people that really know who you are. Lord, um, thank you for the, the journey that Ben's been bringing us through with the past, you know, quite a while at this point through Exodus. Um, you know, we're just so thankful for that beautiful story, Lord, where you use your people just to remind us that um, you know, you're inviting us out of, you know, out of Egypt, if you will, you know, when we say yes to you. But also there is a journey, a hard journey through the desert where we, we also get to learn, even though you've already brought us out of that Egypt, we get to you know, work with you to get the Egypt out of us, mm -hmm. if you will, as we continue to become more like you, as you invite us into you know, your kingdom, your promised land. Um, yeah, Lord, thank you for the you know, reminders of what it looks like to carry and, and interact with you and your glory as we enter into the, you know, the, final, you know, the, the final few chapters of Exodus. Um, Lord, we just pray for Ben that he would mm -hmm. just invite us into understanding your story better in ways that allow us to know, um, to know you more, to know our place in this beautiful kingdom story that you have of, of redemption and restoration. Yeah, that we would, uh, that we would understand the significance of, of carrying your glory, the significance of have, having rhythms and patterns in our life that point us back to you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Lord, thank you for all you're going to do today in, in our hearts as we continue to be a, a people that pursue you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Austin. Appreciate you. Good morning, church. Good to be together. Yeah, man, we had a beautiful time together last night, too, thanks to the team that brought joyous music to us, and the s'mores, and the neighbors that came and ate them with us. It was just a, a sweet time, if you missed it, um, pun intended. So, I look forward also to further gatherings and just restarting some of those regular rhythms as we, as we head into the fall, and uh, we're looking forward to ways to connect with one another, becoming like Jesus together. As we continue, as Austin hinted at, con continuing this long journey, this long road of a, a walking with God people. And that's why this ancient story can be relevant for us today. We find our story within it, and we look for ways that God is still speaking and leading in those same ways because of his character, his nature, and his goodness so I invite you to do two things, to get to Exodus 33, 34, that's the extended section we've been in for a couple weeks. If you're using a Bible uh, from the room here, it's on page 73 and 74. I also invite you to a much later part in the Scripture, but I'm going to tease it out. I'm going to come to this text, this Exodus 33, 34 text, and not read it all because we've read good chunks of it already. Uh, if you're new with us, maybe you can scan some of that or just be ready to follow along. I'm going to come through the side door to this text and quote a verse that may be familiar. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we started singing even on those themes today. I love how that connects. That wasn't a requested song, but there it is. So that sounds familiar to some. If it sounds new, hear it again, because it is amazing. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now, this means much more than what we might first think of in our country, political freedom. This is talking about freedom in Christ, freedom spiritually. If it is familiar, maybe some of you would say, I know who wrote those words. I know who spoke those. That sounds like... Paul. <laughs> it is Paul, the Apostle Paul. Maybe a few others would say, I know that letter of where that comes from. Um, no quiz here, no test, but you can pat yourself on the back if you knew it was from 2 Corinthians, third chapter. And if you did, you probably were just recently in your Bible study in that way. But would you know the context of those words? Because that famous verse, often quoted or repeated, maybe memorized, is probably often taken out of context because the context is very specific. All right, so let me read that verse again and then give you the verse after it and see if it connects some dots. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so we all, with unveiled faces, reflect the Lord's glory. And we are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, 
which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Aha. Paul is commenting in this broader chapter on Exodus 33 and 34. And so I couldn't get through this section without coming to the greatest commentary we have. I read multiple commentaries and scholars as I approach uh, bringing a text before us. And here's Paul, the apostle, the very words of Scripture themselves, quoting and commenting on this story and applying it for the church at that time. And we believe, therefore, the church at our time. My audacious claim last week as we went through this experience of Moses with the Lord asking to see his glory, to experience even more of him, my claim was that for us, for those that are followers of Jesus, for those that are recipients of the Holy Spirit, we have a greater intimacy and closeness to the Lord than even Moses experienced. How could I make that kind of a claim? Because Paul devils down on that idea in this section of Scripture, substantiated right here. We are made for freedom and for ever-increasing glory and transformation. We, with unveiled faces, remember Moses would veil his face because he radiated the glory or the presence of God, he reflected God. We are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. We're made for this, for freedom for ever-increasing glory and likeness in the character of God. We are meant to reflect or radiate, you'll often hear me use another R word, represent the presence of God, his character and his nature. Wherever we go, wherever we live, our neighborhoods, wherever we learn, our schools or online communities, wherever we work, wherever we play and recreate, even wherever we visit and go. And I would invite us to be a people who even where we see that we could send, be sending people for the presence and character of God, reflecting and representing him. This is the central command in all of this story, quite literally, I try not to overuse that word, but this is a perfect application of it, literally the center of the story of Exodus. Exodus 20 is where we find the Ten Commandments. And the highlight, the primary message for God's people, and we looked at that pretty intensely. I think the script, our, most of our English translations do a really poor job translating the, the Hebrew, which would sound like this. Do not carry the name of God in an empty way. That may not sound familiar at all to some of you. Our English translations say something like, do not take the Lord's name in vain. It's not what it says. Now, best, best attempt at translating, not, I guess I am pointing fingers. Consistently through the story is this word that shows up, to bear, to carry. And it's so vital for us to see. Aaron would carry the presence of God, the name of God, the very names of Israel on his priestly garments into the presence of God. And in this most recent part of the story, Moses asked God to carry, very same word, to bear the sins of the people that he would carry. It was their only hope. It's often been called atonement, but that God would carry our sins away. And so right at the center, the literal center of the text is this call to say it positively and to paraphrase it, to carry, to bear the name of God, to reflect God in harmony with who we are, who we've been made to be, image bearers of God, children of God, being made and formed to be like him and to represent him to all the world. So when we see this snapshot story of Moses experiencing the glory of God, coming into his presence, representing the people, and then radiating God's glory and presence back to the people this is a picture of what should happen with all people who draw near to the presence of God, Amen. that we would reflect him, radiate his character and nature, and represent him. 
Now we know tragically in this story, the people are asking for Moses to veil his face, cover that up. That's too, they were, it says they were terrified of the proximity and presence of God's glory and goodness. And we are meant to be drawn to it like moths, not cockroaches. All of this, only possible because of who God is and what he's done. He's loved and pursued us. He desires to dwell with us in our very midst. That's the whole story. God's coming from, from afar, from the heavens, so to speak. Not that that was up, but that's often the idea of the heavens. God is distant and far. He's come down to be with his people. He's come down to rescue them, delivering them from Egypt. He's come down now to the mountaintop of Sinai to meet with Moses and meet with his people, giving them instructions to make a tabernacle that he will come down and dwell and fill. God is coming nearer and nearer in this story. This is what Moses understood was the most important thing, the presence of God. We've seen in Exodus 33, 15. Now we come to read a section of this story that we've seen a couple different times where Moses gets it. He gets that this is the gospel. This is the good news. The good news is that God loves his people so much that he will come near and dwell with them, doing whatever it takes to make that possible, removing all barriers, carrying and taking care of the issue of sin, that we would commune with God. This is good news. In Moses' perspective, he gets it. It's incomplete in its revelation, but he understands this is the core message. He says this in his interaction with God. God, if your presence will not go with us, remember this is in danger because of the golden calf, bull episode. God says, he relents and he says, okay, I will send you, I will be faithful to my promise, I will send you into the promised land and give it to you as I said I would, but I will not go with you. I would consume you on the way. So Moses says, no, no. Because if you will not go with us, if your presence will not go and carry us, there's that word again, bear us up, how will it be known that we have found favor, that I have found favor in your sight, your grace? This is the only thing that matters, he says, paraphrasing. In this way, we shall be distinct. It's the only thing that distinguishes us from all other people, you, your presence, the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you've asked, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. I see you. It's a beautiful promise. It's a beautiful prayer. It's one that we can claim and can pray and should if we understand the gospel, that this is the most important thing, that without God with us, carrying us, going before us, dwelling amongst us. There's nothing else that matters. It's the what distinguishes us and makes us a people. His grace, his presence, his love. God would remain with them. This part of the story is retelling the larger part of the story. And we'll see as we finish Exodus, and we'll finish it very quickly, possibly even next week, I'm not sure. You're like, wait a minute, we're in 34. I flip ahead, there's 40 chapters. The next four chapters are a repeat of the instructions of the tabernacle, almost verbatim. And so we would say, why is that necessary? We could just go back and look. Whenever there's that kind of repetition, we pay attention. There's a reason for it. These were brilliant authors and editors of the story. They're telling something. They're showing us how significant it is that God will do what he said he would do because they've broken covenant. And what did Moses do with the stone tablets? And he came down the mountain and saw the golden calf. He smashed those tablets. Brokenness. Here we see a retelling of the story. New tablets will be formed. God will etch on them again. God's presence is with Moses, as it was at the burning bush at the very beginning. God's presence, his holiness, his voice, his call. Go, Moses, I will be with you. Deliver the people, I will rescue you. Here it is again. Yes, I will. I'll do it again. And so all this repetition that we find is God saying, I will. I will, I will, and you will. 
You'll build this tabernacle and I will dwell with you. And so we, we see his attention to detail is in the call. So these echoes of the story of the burning bush and it happening again, of Israel breaking covenant and God reestablishing it. So we have, even in, this, in 34, we have this repetition of the covenant kind of markers at a high level. I will go, I will be with you, you will do this, you will not, you will not make treaty with the foreign nations, you will not set up idols, you will honor the festivals, you will bring your first fruits. All things we've seen before, highlighting the covenant relationship. We could go back into the broader story. There's clear echoes here of the covenant with Noah and his descendants after they came through the flood and out of the ark and God's promise to make them fruitful and multiply them, giving them a new land and blessing them and therefore all nations, all peoples of the earth. And so it seems, as we, because as we understand the bigger story and see this repetition, that this is who God is and what God always does. No matter how far we might drift or stray or break covenant or turn from God or doubt or raise up our own idols, alongside God or in addition to God or even apart from God, God remains faithful and unchanging, will love and pursue his people, will call them back, will carry their sin, will be present with them. His voice will come and call to lead them and he will go with us. This is the gospel. And again, Moses has it incomplete in its full revelation. We, as people now, on this side of the cross, look back to ultimately what God has done to be present with his people, to carry their sin, to bear it far away, and to come and even fill his people with his presence, to be with them forever that they may dwell in the house of the Lord all days. This is the story. This is what we get to experience. This is what Paul was pointing to when he writes the commentary in 2 Corinthians 3, finding his story and these new Christians and their story within the bigger story. And so it's worth taking some time to read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, listen or follow along in your, in your Bibles or your devices and hear the parable. At minimum, this teaches us how the ancients, or at least how Paul, studied the Bible. This is the only Bible that they had, the only Bible that Jesus had, the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew story. And the way that he does it, we may be, we may be accustomed to, but try to put yourself into that context. The religious Jewish leaders and rabbis at the time hearing Paul, a zealot, a Pharisee, a, a, a high-level scholar all of his life, take the Hebrew Scriptures and apply them in their fullness to Christ would have been blasphemous. Not just that it only has its fulfillment in Christ and the harshness kind of, of criticism that Paul speaks toward the religious leaders of whom he was one, but even in the way of taking the scriptural story and making it metaphorically applicable to God's people in his day, which gives us great encouragement as we study the scripture and try to find our story and a greater understanding, anything that would lead us to a greater understanding and therefore intimacy and closeness with God is the whole purpose of the scriptures. We don't worship the scriptures, we worship the God of the scriptures. And so anything that leads us to that experience is a beautiful way to approach the text. And Paul does. So it's worth it. By now, you should be there. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 and following. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, pause, I think that makes sense. Like We're going back to the story. We're going back to the... The, the stone tablets engraved. What does he mean by the ministry that leads to death? He'll talk other places about understanding sin and our nature according to the law, the 
the ancient scriptures, the Old Testament, we may call it, First Testament. It's a ministry that led to death and that pointed to there's only one way to lead to life, God carrying our sin, ultimately in Christ. So he's not, he's not in that statement blaspheming the text, saying it's worthless. He's saying what it reveals to us is a separation from God, ultimate death, the consequence of breaking covenant, things we've seen consistently through the story. But that ministry, even though all it could do was lead to death, probably some parallel to the death of and sacrifice of the animals, right? All it, all it has to do with is death. Even that, though, was glorious, so that the Israelites even saw the glory of God on the face of Moses, even though it was fading. So if that's true, even, even this ancient story is, still comes in glory because of the presence of God and what he does, how much more, there's the comparison, how much more will the ministry of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, be even more glorious. See, he's starting to say our eyes are being opened to the bigger story of what God is doing. If the ministry that just that condemns humankind is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? That was then, this is now. We are seeing more fully. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. What was fading away came now into glory. How much greater is the glory of that which lasts? What we have now experienced in Christ is what he's saying. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we can be bold, very bold. We're not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing upon it because of the radiance of God's glory, though it was fading away. But their minds were dull. For to this day that same veil remains whenever the old covenant, the first covenant, is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. For whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Remember when Jesus died upon that cross, that actual veil, the curtain in the temple, was torn away. So there's definitely a parallel, a metaphor there that Paul is speaking of. And here we have the verse we've quoted now three times. For the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. It's a beautiful text. We could spend a lot of time dissecting it but at least understand the greater context of these statements that we now have our eyes open, our hearts unveiled because of what Christ has done and what we've experienced and now the filling of the Spirit. This is what we are made for, for hope, for glory, for freedom, for transformation, all because of the presence of God with us, the Spirit in us. These last couple weeks, we've looked at this story and and really responded, or I've invited us to respond individually, to find our story within it. Being reminded of God's goodness, receiving his grace, being reminded that at its core the gospel is this, God's pursuit of us, to dwell with us in intimacy, in communion. And so we've sought to respond to that, to live lives with him, not for him, not from him, not under him, but with him. And from that withness, our lives are transformed. And so we've sought to respond this way and receive it. And Paul reminds us too in this text that life with God, with the Spirit, is always progressing, growing, advancing, ever increasing. It's who we're called to be and meant to be because our God is this way. He's moving, he's expanding, he's making all things new. He's leading his people and the story arc of all history into full redemption and glory. This is what we're invited to. We as individuals to become more and more Christ-like. Remember also though, as we've responded individually, that we need to respond corporately, collectively. In fact, more often than not, when we read the scriptures, 
the writers, including Paul, are writing to a people. A church, if it's a letter of Paul's, or in the greater story, to a group of people. And so, rightly to receive it, we must use the collective, the plural we, which we don't have much in English unless we're from the South, the y'all. This is for y'all. This is for the body, for the church. And so we need to receive it that way and respond. We can't only respond individually. That's right to do and good to do. But we need to then collectively say, how do we engage this story and make it ours? As we've been refreshing kind of the language of our identity and character as a church, which you heard from Austin and Sarah too again today, that we want to be a people who first know that we belong with God, belong to him, with him, and therefore, as we do, we belong with one another. Those that are also being drawn and coming to him. And we want to make sure all people know that that's true for them. That's our character and our core. And from that place, as we belong to him and with him and know it, and we're, that's a lifelong journey of always uh, his, receiving his love and pursuit and coming into a sense of belonging and closeness with him, living there, walking with him. From there, we become more and more like him. We're meant to transform into his likeness and his goodness, ever increasing, as Paul says. And we want to be a people who become like him together. That's not meant to be a, a solo pursuit. It's meant to be the collective, the y'all. We do this together. And from that place of becoming and being transformed and experiencing his glory, we become a blessing, that third B. Not that we shouldn't ask, how can we bless, Lord? Who can we see to go and serve and bless, but that as, yes, 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 good, but as we become like him and carry his nature and character, we will bless as we go. Because being a people who represent his character, as we see in this story, and certainly as we see throughout the scriptures, God's character of love and mercy and grace and peace and hope and patience and gentleness and kindness and goodness, that's a blessing. That's what our world desperately needs. And if we reverse the order, if we get the order wrong, we gotta go and do that more. We then, what are we relying on? Our own strength, our own ability, and we can probably accomplish a lot. There's some gifted, smart, able people right here in this room and certainly more broadly in the church as a whole. But if we get that order wrong, we may never actually come to commune with God and reflect his glory. It may be our glory. And so the order is so vital that we first dwell with God as he desires to dwell with us, belonging to him, becoming more like him, so that that character that fruit of the Spirit living in us is genuine, is obvious. This is what I believe it means to radiate and reflect the glory. Now, I don't know if Moses' face actually tangibly glowed or not. We talked about that last week. Do you know people that just glow with a joy that seems unnatural, that makes you go, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's real. But we should. You should. What does it mean to truly glow with the presence of God? We're all going to look different in that. That's a, a beautiful expression of the infinite nature of God, that we are all beautifully unique, and yet the fruit of the Spirit should be growing and consistent in our lives. From the words that we say, to the attitude that we hold, to the social media posts that we make, it should radiate the character and nature of God. This is our collective response. And so, how do we pray? Do we pray as Moses prayed? God, if you will not be with us, do not send us. Yes, I think yes. Yes, but. <laughs> we can also get stuck there. 
because God has already emphatically answered that prayer. If we form it in a question, God, will you go with us? God, will you be amongst us? God, will you lead us? He's already emphatically said to the church, I will. Both in, to Moses that we can receive and bring forward, I will do the very thing that you asked. I will be with you and I will give you rest. And you say, well, wait a minute, that was that context. That was 3,000 years ago. That was for Israel. And it's the, right, it's the right question when we read the ancient story to say, does this apply to us today? But when you see the repetition of the promise throughout the scriptures and fulfilled in Christ, as we already have, where Paul says, yes, then we claim it, then we bring it forward. Not in an actual way necessarily, I don't want to overforce the application, but that God is already saying, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm in you, go. Has he said go? See, we can get stuck and say, God, if you will not, where, where shall we go? How shall we move? What shall we do? And perhaps we have. And God has already said, I'm with you. I will give you rest. You need to go. Now, some of us, in fact, all of us, already are going. You're not staying here in this room all week. You're on the move. Wherever you live, work, learn, play, visit, travel to, and see. You're on the move. You're already going to lots of places in this incredible world that we, that we have and region of our earth. You're on the move already. God, go with us. God, lead us. God, guide us. Not bad prayers, but he's already answered them. The final instructions were given in According to Jesus, through, to his disciples, Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. You probably know these words. Baptize them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you and we had better finish the promise. For I am surely with you always to the end of the age. There's the with promise. So when Jesus doubles down on the very same words that his father said to Moses, I will be with you and I will give you rest. I will lead you. And Jesus says the exact same things in his words. Go make followers. Go bless the earth. Go. For surely I am with you to the very end. The ends of the earth and the end of time. So let's not get stuck in the corporate response. We pray it today. And like in these moments, not that God needs reminding, just as we see in the story. It actually says Moses reminded God of his promise because God engages with us at a level we can understand, not because God is forgetful. And so we pray that way. God, we remind you of your promise that you will be with us, that you will give us rest, and that you have sent us. So we're going. How do I make disciples? Not through more effort and work and gosh, I really do need to talk to that neighbor of mine. I've really been. Now, if God is speaking that, there's conviction and encouragement, not guilt. So if there's guilt in that, that's of you or someone else, not God. But if there's encouragement, yes. Yes, I get to. The response is, God, remind us again of your presence with us that as we draw near, we would radiate you, your character. Not that we would go and work harder. If that's ever the result of a message that I give, I failed to communicate it or you failed to hear it. That we are sent people with the presence of God and because of him, we get to live and move and have our being. So we pray, God, with, be with us, transform us by your spirit alone, not our effort, by your glory, 
Make us radiate and reflect and represent your character and nature. For God's glory is our joy. And God's people radiating this joy and presence and character will bless the earth and may just transform it. And so let me abruptly end this message here and let's pray into this. Then Austin's going to come and help lead us into this response and into communion and the team will come. Would you just take a moment and maybe it's a posture of opening hands. Moses fell to the ground on his knees and worshipped. We're invited to change our postures to represent our heart. What does it mean to have a veil removed from our heart? God, will you, that we would have nothing between us and you, that we are open to receive your spirit again Maybe for some, a sense of the first time. For you are making all things new. As we've already been reminded and already sung today, you're with us. Sometimes the weight of your presence is heavier, and we want that. We want more of you. Forgive us where we have walked in our own strength and ability, even in ways that are trying to live for your glory and your kingdom and, and your call and make disciples where we have done it in our strength and it's probably been very fruitless. Forgive us, God. Where we have lived only, to, only trying to live for you that we could then be close to you. Forgive us, God. A false gospel. We want to dwell with you and walk with you and carry your name and character and that you would be faithful to your promise, that the fruit of your spirit would be noticeable, tangible, new, genuine, that all would know how good you are, that you love all peoples, and to des desire to be with them. From that intimacy, from that dwelling in your house spiritually, our lives would be transformed to ever-increasing glory, Lord, some of us have very obvious ways this morning that we want to see transformation of our hearts, our character, our attitude, our hope or lack of it, our peace or lack of it. God, transformation, please, we need it. Help us, be with us. For your glory is our joy and it's where we want to dwell. Thank you that you've made it possible. You've done it all through Christ who has come in the flesh to be amongst us, who has carried our sin to the cross, to the grave and put it to death, removing it completely. You've carried it, Lord, and by your grace alone we live. We receive. We are made whole. Remind us as we come to your table today of the sacrifice you made, your body broken, your blood shed, that we might live. And that's the hope of the whole story. That our eyes have been opened, the veil has been removed, and we get to know the fullness of your gospel, that we get to dwell with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. So team, come. Austin, come and just lead us as the Lord is leading you to respond and sing and worship and take communion. Amen. Well, church, as I was listening to, to Ben, I kept coming back to a different, a different uh, passage by, by Paul, also on freedom, um, that, long, that long confused me. It's in Galatians 5 where it says, it's for freedom that we have been set free. And... I said for the longest time, I was like, what, is, what does that really mean? But reflecting on 
Uh, I mean, something the Lord revealed to me, I mean, a while ago, but reflecting on today, just this idea of if we are a people that God has placed his spirit in us, that we are, as he says in, you know, the, in, in 2 Corinthians, that we are being transformed into his likeness, that we are, that we, as we accept that invitation to carry his spirit and be transformed, we're seeing ever increasing glory. People that, you know, are growing in the fruit of the spirit that are being changed into the nature of Jesus. We don't need the law anymore. We need freedom. Like we, God is trusting us with that freedom. 